and to the people, all for your greater glory and for the nation that you have given us. Amen. I am Shao Chua, a public historian and assistant professorial lecturer at the De La Salle University Manila Department of History. Welcome to the Philippine International Quincentennial Conference Panel B, or Session 4, Religion, Colonialism, and the Revolution, a Quincentennial or Quincentennial Reflections. This is convened by the De La Salle University Manila Department of History and the National Historical Commission of the Philippines with uh, in partnership with the Department of Foreign Affairs, the National Historical Commission of the Philippines in solidarity with the quincentennial commemorations in the Philippines, the 2021 year of pre-colonial ancestors uh, funded by the Philippine Spanish Friendship Day. And, uh, and thank you to all our, um, our um, friends. I would like to uh, uh, acknowledge the presence of the president of the Philippine National Historical Society, uh, Dr. Bernardita Churchill. Maraming po salamat, ma'am, uh, for being active in this conference. And in many ways, your presence uh, as, uh, of course, our, isa sa mga tinitingala natin sa uh, ating uh, disiplina ay uh, talaga namang nabubuhayan tayo ng loob, lalo na mga kabataan, the, the young people who are here, no? And uh, a lot of our teachers who are with us from different parts of the country. I would like to just uh, acknowledge that we are actually currently live on almost 100 Facebook pages. Wow. This is really a product of public history, these conferences. Again, primarily at the National Quincentennial Committee, Department of Foreign Affairs, and other foreign service posts the National Historic Commission of the Philippines, and the National Commission for Culture and the Arts, among others. And also at the uh, DLSU or De La Salle University Department of History Facebook page. So yun po mga kaibigan. Ako, uh, before I introduce our um, speakers, I would like to basically call attention to the quincentennial, uh, uh, our theme for this uh, session, Religion, Colonialism, and the Revolution, Quincentennial Reflections. For this panel, Panel B, uh, it would be about colonization and revolutions. Uh, there are so many people who are saying that uh, the events of 1521 um, were not as important because you know, Magellan came and Magellan was killed by uh, Lapu-Lapu in the victory at Mactan. And colonialism will really happen by 1565, when Miguel Lopez de Legazpi will arrive in Cebu. Now, um, of course, we want to emphasize this, that yes, that may, that may be true. Colonialism started in 1565, but in many ways, the events that uh, happened in 1521 became the onset. You know, because of those events, the Spaniards had an eye on these islands and on these people. And we were marked for colonial colonization because of this. And after the events impactful beyond the Spanish regime, but even up to today, we still feel the effects of the things that were ushered in by 1521. And that is why, if you're going to look at the this conference, this session, and the whole quincentennial commemorations of the Philippines. This is not just about Magellan. This is not just about the circumnavigation of the world. We're looking at the context of 1521. We're looking at the effects of 1521, but also at the world that changed in 1521 or because of 1521. And that is why we are also talking about our ancestors. So we're, we, we are also highlighting in the quincentennial commemorations in the Philippines, our ancestors. So that's why it is inevitable that we are going to talk about the Malay world, Dunya Melayu. Okay? And uh, of course, eventually, the victory at Mactan, the victory of Lapu-Lapu against Magellan will be the inspiration 
for the founders of the Filipino nation. Some people would say that Lapu Lapu is a local hero, just a local hero, but he has national significance because the Filipino revolution, the propagandists used Lapu Lapu uh, to, to encourage people to fight for nationalism, for the creation of the Filipino nation. And that is why the struggle for genuine and absolute independence is also uh, relevant to the quincentennial commemorations in the Philippines. So I do hope that you see now the quincentennial commemorations, not just as a commemoration of 1521, but as a commemoration of the 500 year history of our country. And to begin, uh, our session uh, for today, I would like to call um, our colleague in the department. He, he is Associate Professor of History at the De La Salle University, Manila. At present, he is Director of the Southeast Asia Research Center and Hub, or SEARCH, at the same university, where he also served previously as Assistant Dean for Research and Advanced Studies of the College of Liberal Arts. He is the former Vice President of the Philippine Historical Association, and still a member of the board of the PHA. He is also a member of the Social Science Research Ethics Board, or SSRED, of the Philippine Social Science Council, or the PSSC, and former member of the Advisory Council of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines. His research interests include rural history, Southeast Asian history, local history, oral history, and biographies. To talk about a past rediscovered Malay civilization, colonial encounters, and the Illustrados. Please welcome from the De La Salle University, Manila, Dr. Fernando A. Santiago, Jr. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Chua, for that very kind introduction. Uh, please allow me to share my presentation. Do you see it now? Yes, sir. Well, first of all, um, well, I have to. I have to do a special greeting for Dr. Churchill. Um, so nice to see you, ma'am. It's been quite some time, okay, and it's really pleasant to see you this afternoon. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to my um, colleagues at the Department of History of De La Salle University, the conveners okay, from the National Centennial Commission, okay, and our guests, uh, good afternoon. So as uh, Professor Chuba had already mentioned, the title of my presentation is a past rediscovered Malay civilization, colonial encounters, and the Illustrados. Now, while, while we are commemorating the quincentenary of the Filipinos' hospitality to the Magellan expedition, let us also remember that 2021 is the 125th anniversary of the 1896 Philippine Revolution. My presentation is a humble attempt to bridge these two important events. This study is part of a larger work and some parts have been previously presented in other scholarly fora. But the main argument of my presentation today is that the Illustrados rediscovery of a forgotten past broadened their sense of identity and catalyzed a revolutionary spirit, okay, a term coined by John Neri. So it catalyzed a revolutionary spirit that extended beyond the Philippine archipelago. So let me begin by first discussing Malay civilization in the Philippines. Okay, or another way to look at it would be uh, the Filipinos in the Malay world. The oldest historical evidence, um, in the, the oldest historical document in the Philippines is the Laguna Copper inscription. Written in Old Malay, it serves as evidence of Malay culture in the Philippines during ancient times. This loan document, inscribed in a sheet of copper states uh, what you see before you, okay, which I, I won't read anymore uh, in consideration of the time limitations. Okay, but while you are reading, dating to 900 common era and in writing that bears similarities 
with the ancient Tawi script of Indonesia. Analysis by experts reveal a language that contained Sanskrit, Old Javanese, Old Malay, and Old Tagalog words. Aside from mentioning toponyms that are still familiar today, it attests to the Hindu influence of the Sumatra-based Srivijayan Empire, which had spread beyond the central part of the Philippine archipelago to the barangays of Tondo and Manila. Citing Antun Postma, who is regarded as the primary expert on this, uh, uh, on this topic, uh, Zu Salazar states that the document is considered to be clearly Old Malay and contains several words that are identical or closely related to the Old Tagalog language. Like for instance, okay, um, the translation would show the, um, the words anak, okay, which we understand to mean child, dayang or noble woman, hadapan or harapan in front, hutang or utang or debt, okay, ngaran or ngalan for name, pamagat, okay, for the title, and tuhan or tuan, for the honorable person. Okay, and, and there are other etymologically related words that uh, were found on the or in the Laguna Copper inscription. Now, furthermore, the inscription is certainly related to, although not identical, with the famous Srivijayan inscriptions of the end of the seventh century and several other old Malay inscriptions of the ninth century from central Java. Therefore, the oldest historical document in the Philippines reveals our connection to a broader world. Okay, what I am referring to as the Dunya Melayu, okay, as used by Dr. Zuz Salazar, uh, it can be referred to as Nusantara, Nusantara, which is the popular term in the region. Okay, but uh, again, the bottom line is that it is the Malay world or even Malay civilization. Another historical document is the Summa Oriental. The earliest European reference to the Philippines and Filipinos comes from Tome Piresh in his book, Summa Oriental, which was written between 1512 to 1515. Piresh, who was Portuguese, stayed in Malacca right after its capture in 1511 where he observed Filipinos, whom he calls Lusoes. He also refers to the Filipinos as Lusoes, I'm sorry, to the Philippines as Lusoes, a name derived from the largest island of the archipelago, Luzon, which he says to be 10 days sail beyond Borneo. And by the way, in the old Indian records, the Philippine archipelago was referred to as Lusoes and not just the island of Luzon. It is the entire, the entire group of islands okay, from the Indian records. In the narrative, he states the following. Okay, So you'll find here a description of, uh, uh, of our um, place and people. Okay, So they, they, he said that uh, we are nearly all heathen. We have no king, okay, but we are ruled by groups of elders. He described us as robust people, little thought of in Malacca, okay, and that uh, they referring to us have two or three junks at most. They, they take the merchandise of Borneo and from there they come to Malacca. So he goes on to um, describe the different products, okay, that were bought by the Borneans from the Philippines, such as gold, foodstuffs, okay, and he described the gold coming from this part of the world as um, of being low quality, okay, in fact, very low quality, okay, um, and aside from other products, he also mentions, okay, an important detail, and uh, based on several interpretations, um, Tom, Tome Piresh mentions that a high-ranking official in Malacca was actually of Filipino uh, background, okay, or what would be today's Filipino, okay, uh, the Tumonguo, or the uh, local magistrate. Okay, so it's a different. It was a different system. So the local magistrate was the magistrate involved in trade, and he was a Filipino. Now he also mentions that of this family, there are now the sons of the Tumonguo and his wife in Malacca, 
as well as his mother-in-law and the Curia Raja and the Tuambraji who married the Tumonguo's wife. In Mijam, okay, uh, which is in, on the island of Sumatra across okay, the Malay Peninsula, uh, there were 500 Lusoes, some of them important men and good merchants who want to come to Malacca. And the people of Mijam will not grant them permission because they, are, they have now gone over to the side of the former king of Malacca, not very openly. The value of Piresh account is that it predates the arrival of Magellan's expedition to the Philippines. So Magellan arrived in 1521. And like I said, okay, Piresh was in Malacca between 1511 to 1515. Now, it is evidence of the active presence of pre-colonial Filipinos in present-day Malaysia and the various islands of Indonesia during the early 16th century. It also documents how deeply immersed ancient Filipinos were in the social, economic, and political life of the region. The next historical document is Antonio Pigafetta's Relazione del Primo Viaggio in Torno al Mondo, the account of the events of the Magellan expedition, which arrived in the Philippines in 1521. When Magellan, or with Magellan, was Enrique, or Enrique de Malacca, his Malay slave, who spoke Spanish fluently and thus served as the interpreter of the Armada de Maluco on its maiden quest to reach the Spice Islands by sailing west in 1519. Pigafetta records natives as follows. On Thursday, the 28th of March, we saw a small boat, which they call Baloto, with the eight men in it, which came near to the captain general's ship. Then a slave of his, who was of Zamatra, formerly called Taprobana, spoke to, these, to those men at a distance, and they heard him speak and came alongside the ship, but withdrew off quickly. Two hours or so later, we saw approaching two long boats, which they call Balanghai, full of kings no more languages than the common people do. It was at this moment that Magellan and his men asserted that they had arrived at their destination, a confirmation that the world was indeed drowned after many months at sea and encountering various peoples, for it was the first time that anyone communicated in a language that was commonly understood, the language of Enrique, which was Malay, the lingua franca of the Malay world. Of note is that the expedition did not encounter anyone who spoke Malay beyond the Philippines, therefore suggesting that it was the eastern limit of the Malay world, at least based on language. Pigafetta also notes that the kings know more languages than the common people do, which shows that Malay was not the vernacular language. Nonetheless, a word list in the account includes several Malay words used in the local language. Aside from language, Pigafetta notes many other details showing that Malay features existed in the Philippines and were part of Philippine culture at the time. Another observation comes from Francisco Colin, an early 17th century Spanish chronicler who surmised that the Tagalogs are descended from the Malays by the Tagalog language, which resembles Malay closely, by the color and lines of the whole body, by the clothing and habit that they wore at the arrival of the Spaniards here. And lastly, by the customs and ceremonies derived from the Malays and other nations of India. Similar observations were made by other chroniclers such as Antonio de Morga, Francisco Combes, Gemelli Carreri, Gaspar de San Agustin, Juan Francisco de, de San Antonio, and Joaquin Martinez de Zuniga. These and other accounts document Malay culture in Philippine society. Now, there are other um, examples okay, that are still evident at present. So here's a list of loan words. 
okay, uh, from Malay, such as Tanghali, which is supposed to come from Tangahari, Salita from Serita, Balita from Berita, Dalita, Dalita from Derita, Agimat from Azimat, Agos, okay, or uh, waves from Arus, etc., etc. But elements of Malayness can also be found in our native architecture, our political system, okay, with the Rajas and the Datus, our uh, fondness for uh, Sabong, okay, which is common throughout the region, Gamelan music, the sound of the Kulintang is the sound of island Southeast Asia and not just the Philippines. Even our superstitions and beliefs, including the, uh, the belief that the first um, man and woman emerged from a bamboo that split. Okay, just like the story of Malakas and Maganda. Elementals, okay, um, you know, ghosts and ghouls, uh, which resonate throughout the region because of similarities and slight variances. Like, for example, the Chanak uh, would be a baby, uh, a baby monster in the Philippines, but in other parts of Southeast Asia, it is actually what we call the white lady. Okay, but then the, the word Dianak and Pontianak, the resemblance cannot be um, denied. Of course, among other things would be weapons, ships and boats, and many other details that unfortunately we do not have time to discuss. Okay, but all of these are evidence that um, um, our culture okay, was part of what, we, what uh, scholars now describe, at least scholars of the region now describe as Malay civilization. Now the other standard of Malayness Okay, aside from culture and civilization, is race. Now, while race today is understood more as a lived social experience, in the 19th century, it was appreciated in the context of human taxonomy. Okay, so people were classified as if we were different species of animals. Now, Different um, groups wrote about the Philippines, different people of different nationalities wrote about the Philippines and among them were the Spanish. In their writings, Spanish chroniclers such as Juan de Placencia, Pedro Chirino, Antonio de Morga, Francisco Colin, Ignacio Alcina, Francisco Combes, Gaspar de San Agustin, and Joaquin uh, M. Martinez de Zuniga loosely described Filipinos and their ways as Malay. Okay, so they described us as Malay people. In scholarly circles, it was the English writers who led the trend to broaden the term Malay from its older meanings, okay, uh, as royal lineage, trade diaspora, or language, into a term for widespread regions and people. Among them was John Crawford, who opens the first chapter of the of the uh, of his book History of the Indian Archipelago, published in 1820 by describing two aboriginal races in the Malay archipelago. And he described them as being uh, each um, a different from each other as both are from all the rest of their species. He says that this is the only portion of the globe which presents so much unusual, okay, uh, sorry, this is the portion of the globe which presents so unusual a phenomenon. One of these races may be generally described as a brown complexion people with lank hair, and the other as a black and rather sooty colored race with woolly or frizzled hair. Crawford could not help but make broad statements on the races of the native inhabitants, for it was to him the distinctive, if not the defining feature of the region. So there were the Negrito types and the Malay types. But nonetheless, among the brown complexion people he refers to are the Filipinos, for he includes the Philippines in his description of their region's topography and ways. Now, what you see before you is Alfred Russell Wallace's um, account from his book, The Malay Archipelago, published in 1869. And it provides a much more detailed description of the race. He makes distinctions among the groups that he considered to be the true Malay races. 
Now, I'm not going to read this out anymore, okay? But the bottom line is he described four true Mali races. The first one being the um, Malays proper, okay? Those who inhabited uh, present-day Malaysia, uh, particularly uh, peninsular Malaysia, the Javanese of the island of Java, the Bugis of, the, of uh, the greater part of Celebes, okay, and Sumbawa. And uh, of note would be the fourth group, um, uh, which he, he, well, let me just read, the fourth great race, okay, that is the Tagalas in the Philippine Islands. And in his, in, in his words, many of them are now Christians and speak Spanish as well as their native tongue, the Tagala. Of interest, is his inclusion of the Tagalas, for not only does he classify them among the true Mali races, he also describes them as Christian and Spanish speaking and thus Hispanized. Considering the religious and linguistic distinctions pointed out by Wallace, the narrative reveals a standard of Malayness that acknowledges cultural diversity within the race. It also manifests the recognition of the overlap of the world's great civilizations in the Malay archipelago. Now, aside from the Spanish and English ethnographers, Germans also classified um, uh, Filipinos as Malay. Uh, of course, um, Ferdinand Blumentritt, who was Austrian, okay, was among them. And he uh, devoted significant attention to the question on the civilization, origin, and race of the Filipinos. He also attempted the serious scholarly appraisal of other ethnographers' theories and data. In his book, Towards an Ethnography of the Philippines, published in 1882, he identifies 57 different groups in the Philippines. Now, uh, the author Thomas points out that all but six in the group are categorized as subgroups of the general racial category of Malay. So out of 57, Okay, um, only six were not counted to be Malay by Ferdinand Blumentritt. Now, in 1885, a French scholar by the name of Joseph Montano published a rapport sur un mission o il, il Philippines et en Malaisi, his report to the Minister of Public Education of France on a scientific mission to the Philippines and Malaya. In his study, he describes Filipinos as descended from three ancestral races that arrived in separate waves. And he said that these were the Negritos, Indonesians, and Malays. If it sounds familiar because, well, that's because uh, it, it is the, the basic form of uh, what most of us know. Joseph Montano actually provided this uh, theory as early as 1885. Now, Again, in the same uh, account, uh, Montano uh, argues that the majority of Filipinos are Malays. Now, these accounts show that Europeans had a consensus on the racial classification of most Filipinos. But Anthony Milner warns that the use of Malay as a classifier by Europeans does not mean that the vocabulary reflects the consciousness of the people themselves. Okay, they called us Malays, but doesn't mean that we consider ourselves to be Malays. He added that certain comments from the period on the attitudes of the Malays themselves add to their reason for caution. And he cites uh, William Marsden's remark okay, that um, in many Malay letters, people rarely called themselves Malay, okay, not even the people of uh, Malaysia itself. Now, they're limited identification with Malay is a reminder that the usage of the term in the 19th century scientific circles may have signified more the identity constructed by Western thinkers. Okay, so the Malayness was not a local uh, construct, okay, not a local knowledge product, but rather a knowledge product of the West. And um, according to uh, Professor uh, Murad uh, Ahmad Murad Merikan, uh, this was the beginnings of a Eurocentric perspective on the Malay world, 
illustrative of the European representation of the other. Nonetheless, the Illustrados embraced these Western ideas as they built their identity with race as one variable. For Rizal, in particular, the affiliation with the Malay race also led to the recognition of a forgotten past, a past where Filipinos played a dynamic role in the Malay world. Now let me discuss the colonial encounters, okay? And to, um, to keep this brief, I will focus on the emergence of the uh, Hispanized Malay, which I use in my research. What distinguishes Filipino, Filipino culture from the rest of the Malay world today is the Hispanic element. Simply put, Hispanic means relating to Spain or Spanish culture. While Hispanization is the process by which Hispanic culture influences a person or place. It involves the adoption of multiple aspects of Spanish life, including okay, Catholic doctrine, values, language, names, manners, cuisine, music, arts, architecture, beliefs, customs, and traditions. Okay, which all occurred in the Philippines. And thus compared to um, nearby countries such as Indonesia and Malaysia and Brunei, okay, um, the Philippines appears to be a synthesis okay, between these countries and Mexico. So we become sort of a hybrid of uh, Hispanic or Latin American and uh, island Southeast Asian cultures. In the Hispanization of the Philippines, John Ledy Felan underscores how the Spaniards put heavy emphasis on Christianization as the most effective means of incorporating Filipinos into Spanish culture, and to which the Filipinos responded enthusiastically. Consequently, Catholicism became, became Spain's deepest imprint on the Philippines. It also redefined the Filipinos' worldview into the Christian, Christian frame, which isolates us from others in the Malay world, okay? The rest of the region being mainly Islamic. Now, um, contrary to the popular view that Spain simply imposed its culture and institutions on the Philippines, Felan describes the process of Hispanization as a dialectic characterized by the clash and synthesis of indigenous and Spanish cultures. Thus, the result was a distinct way of life in the Philippines that stands out in both the Hispanic and Malay worlds. So this dialectic is evident in various aspects of life. Like in Spanish times, uh, well, Spain basically built its administration on top of the Malay system of village organization, uh, so while the Spanish bureaucracy was extended to the Philippines and power was centralized in uh, Madrid, um, in the Philippines at ground level, the Datus and Rajas continued to rule and were simply rebranded as Cabezas de Barangay and Gobernador Silios. So socially, the Malay class structure with the Maginoo, Maharlika, and Alipin remained. Uh, with uh, the different classes being rebranded and the el elites now being referred to instead as uh, senor, senoras, senoritas, and senoritos. Even the manila Acapulco galleon trade okay, connected the Philippines to Mexico and Europe. Um, and, um, but despite all the ecological changes uh, because of you know, the products that came from Mexico, um, the Malay ways and traditions just combined with it and continued to persist. So the point is that despite Spanish colonialism and Hispanization, many elements of um, the Malay civilization remained, but blended with Hispanization. So, uh, so yes, Hispanization led Filipinos but Hispanization, rather, led Filipinos to a detachment from their past. And as Rizal describes in 
Filipinas dentro de 100 años. Then began a new era for Filipinos. They gradually lost their ancient traditions, their recollections. They forgot their writings, their songs, their poetry, their laws in order to learn by heart other doctrines, which they did not understand, other ethics, other tastes, different from those inspired by their race, by their climate, and their way of thinking. Then there was a falling off. They were lowered in their, in their own eyes. They became ashamed of what was distinctively their own in order to admire and praise what was foreign and incomprehensible. Their spirit was broken and they acquiesced. Filipinos were detached okay, from the Malay world. And as a result, states in Sobre la Indolencia de los Filipinos, his other famous essay, the only two countries with which the Philippines continued to have relations were China and Mexico. Okay, so we were cut off from the rest of our civilization. Now, I will proceed to the Illustrados. The discovery of the forgotten past catalyzed the Illustrados into action during the late, the mid to late 19th century. In 1888, Jose Rizal went to London to establish the existence of an extinct civilization in the Philippines. He wanted to prove with historical facts that the people of the Philippines were not naked savages rescued only by the Spaniards. Okay, so because, you know, we were conditioned to believe that we were barbarians saved okay, by, by the Spaniards through Christianity and Hispanization. After more than three, three centuries, the Spaniard civilizing influence was ingrained in our minds. A process which began in the 16th century when they, the conquerors, declared pagan artifacts as symbols of the devil, okay, and thus had to be destroyed and erased. So our memories of our um, Malay past faded as people converted to Christianity and adopted Spanish culture. And not only that, uh, we became condescending, okay? We developed condescending attitudes was given to, the, to that brought by Spanish rule. So they erased our past, made us, made us believe that we progressed because of them and expected us to be thankful. Now, it was while at the British Museum that Rizal found Antonio de Morga's Successos de las Islas Filipinas, okay, which was published in 1609, a first-hand account of uh, the Philippines at the time of contact, which gave Rizal a glimpse of the past that he described as erased from memory. But since he, he recognized his shortcomings, he was not a trained historian, Rizal decided to reprint the book with his annotations instead of writing his own history. And in the foreword, he states what you see before you. Now, he states in the last uh, sentence in this quotation, it is then the ghost of the civilization of our ancestors that the author will now call up before you. So thus showing Rizal's recognition of this past that had been erased from our consciousness. Now, the successos has been described as where the culture and environment of ancient Filipinos considered as naturales malayos are described with sympathy and objectivity. It is described as uh, having impartiality as its main virtue for it to merit serving as the basis for the history of the Filipinos that Rizal envisioned. And for Reynaldo Ileto, this effort was an attempt to reconstruct, sorry, it was an attempt to construct a usable past for the Filipino had to move forward and in order to do so had to be aware of their origin, their history as a colonized people and the general progress of mankind to which their future should be geared. Now, to highlight little known details, Rizal called attention to the parts of Morga's account that described indigenous society as it was encountered by the Spaniards. So he basically contextualized 
ng KD accounts, he viewed Morga's uh, perspective with Filipino eyes, with the perspective of someone or a native of the islands. Um, and then he incorporated the data with other sources to describe pre-Hispanic society. So it was a critical and selective uh, rereading to correct what has been falsified and slandered. Okay, so what we find here is a, a very advanced Jose Rizal because what he was doing is what we are doing now in historiography. Okay, more than a hundred years ago, Rizal was already rereading Philippine history from the perspective of a Filipino. Rizal was such an advanced scholar, okay, and should be given more credit than he is usually accorded. Now, other illustrados pursued ethnography, folklore, and linguistics inspired by the potential held by ethnographic science for discovering pre-Hispanic unity among the different peoples of the Philippines. And here are some examples, okay? And of course, these examples vary in quality as well. But um, together with Rizal's annotation of Morga's successors, these works gave Filipinos a better appreciation of their ancestors, as well as themselves. It must be stressed that the rediscovery of the forgotten past came, or with this came, the recognition of the Filipino's Malay identity. Okay, that's when we started thinking of ourselves as Malay. A turn, uh, well, the Malay turn as referred to by, again, John Mary. Now, um, Ferdinand Blumentritt, an Austrian ethnographer, a good friend of Rizal, played a significant role in this turn, okay, for he was responsible for pointing Rizal towards the Spanish text of Morga. He introduced Rizal, okay, to uh, the uh, German ethnologists such as Rudolf Virchow, uh, Fyodor Yagor, and other, and other members of the Berlin Ethnographic and Berlin Anthropological Societies. Um, yeah, and... Um, he provided Rizal also with the scientific basis to understand Malayness. So according to Anthony Reed, through his extensive correspondence with Blumentritt, Rizal became convinced that his people were the six million oppressed Malays and he himself a Tagalog Malay. This racial identity was also articulated in a letter where Rizal refers to himself and his countrymen as the unfortunate Malays of the Philippines. You know, the bottom line is these statements I'm sharing show you that Rizal did not just see his identity from a scientific lens. His perspective was politicized. On the other hand, it was also grounded in the idea of a pre-colonial Malayan way of life um, that was erased from memory, okay? So, well, anyway, so what I said earlier was, uh, um, would eventually spread among Rizal's contemporaries and they would later find expression in the efforts to define the Filipino national identity. So again, just to highlight the point, their sense of identity was grounded in, in two ways, okay? Uh, the identity based on Malayness was grounded in two ways. It was grounded in race and it was also grounded in culture. But this was the 19th century. So unlike today, when um, present day uh, anthropologists okay, agree that there are no human biological races, we're all the same. We're all the same animal. We're all the same species. Okay, we look different, but we are the same. And our differences um, are really um, more, more of the lived experiences. We look, we are the same animal, but we do not, you know, live life the same way because of our differences. But genetically, there's, you know, we are essentially the same. We're not, you know, different animals. So um, Salazar observes that the Illustrados' interest was conditioned um, by the search for a new identity, in reality, a national one. Okay, within a colonial frame. Malay identity in this quest was a past condition as a basis for a broader reference point beyond the present. And like the desired Filipino nationality out of the colonial institution, it was a vision projected into the future. Okay, so that's according to Dr. Zeus Salazar. 
Now, V Malay turn. Animated Rizal and his fellow expatriates in Europe for, for in quick su succession, Rizal formed the following associations, the Kidlat Club, the Indios Bravos, and the RDLM. Of interest is the RDLM, a secret organization whose name is believed to be the acronym for Redemption de los Malayos, or Redemption of the Malay Race. You know, the group was so secretive that no one really found out what it, tru it truly means. So whatever we believe it means is just the result of intelligent assumptions. Okay? And alternative meanings that Redención de los Malayos, or sorry, the, the, uh, the anagram uh, RDLM has been given or have been given are Regeneración de los Malayos or the Regeneration of the Malays and even República. The Los Malayos. Okay. Of course, um, some of them are also joking. It could be um it could be simply Rosa del Mar, okay, or um the other one is um uh, renegado del matrimonio or renegade of marriage. So it can mean anything actually, okay. But you know, based on the studies of uh, gentlemen like Leoncio Lopez Rizal, okay, uh, and interviews with people who who were in contact with members of the IDLM. Uh, these were the closest uh, possible meanings. These are the closest possible meanings. Now, for Austin Coates, beneath the concealment of the IDLM was the pledge to the liberation of the Malay peoples from colonial rule, a pledge to be made good first in the Philippines, later to be extended to the inhabitants of Borneo, Indonesia, and Malaysia. The racial undertone cannot be denied, especially considering at that time that Rizal read and appears to have been deeply affected by Multatulis Max Havelar. And according to the accounts, during the time of the RDLM, Rizal okay, was constantly referring to, the, uh, to Multatulis Max Havelar and pointing out the similarities, okay, if not the identical experience of the Javanese under the Dutch and the Filipinos under Spain. So we were experiencing the same thing. In 1896, militant nationalism gave birth to the Philippine Revolution, the first of its kind in Southeast Asia. Filipino leaders declared independence from Spain on June 12, 1898, and thus fulfilled the promise of the struggle. However, by February the following year, war would break out with the United States, and before long, we were once again colonized. But the Pan-Malayan consciousness was voiced during the struggle by no less than Apolinario Mabini, the brain of the revolution. While the Philippine Revolution of 1896 was a struggle for national independence, Mabini understood it in the broader perspective of the liberation of the Malayan peoples. So as stated here in, uh, uh, in, a, in a quotation from um, Majul. Um, so according to Cesar Adi Majul, he reminded his countrymen that they were Malayos Filipinos. This consciousness that the Filipinos belonged to a wider race. The Malay race enabled Manab Mabini to conceive of future cooperation, if not unity, among the different peoples of the Malay archipelago. When he was once asked by an American officer in Guam whether the Filipinos were really, uh, sorry, were ready uh, to govern themselves, Mabini uh, Mabini's ready answer was that not only could they govern themselves, but they were also ready to become part of a confederation of Asian states. For him, the Philippine Revolution was therefore more than a struggle for national independence. It was a springboard for the liberation of the entire Malay race. So I'm, I'm now um, near my, the, the end of my presentation. Mabini saw the revolution, in his words, as a movement that has its sole and final end to maintain alive and resplendent the torch of liberty and civilization in Oceania, to illuminate the gloomy night in which the vilified and degraded Malay race finds itself, in order that it may be led to the road of social emancipation. Now, this was 
how the rediscovery of a forgotten past became at one point in our history a catalyst for the decolonization not only of the Philippines, but of the entire region. Thank you very much. That is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fernie Santiago. You know, the, the, the presentation is uh, very, very enlightening because it shows us the importance of the ways history was actually written will affect how the future generation will view not just events in the past, but also their identity and in many ways their future. The, the writings about our ancestors and about the Filipinos by foreigners, and one of the pioneers was Pigafetas in 1520 about the events of 1521. Uh, actually had the, had an impact because we drew from them these insights but we made them or we we we, we refashioned them in a filipino perspective so i, I remember uh, dr santiago that jose Vizal was the one who actually uh, suggested that lapu lapu based on the pigafetta one of the oldest Pigafetta manuscripts, the Ambrosiana, if I'm not mistaken, in which the name, because they were mistaken with the name of Lapu-Lapu, uh, it was Kalipu-Lapu, they said. And, and Rizal uh, looked at the more old, old uh, the older manuscripts of Pigafetta and said, look, uh, his name here is Si Lapu-Lapu, and probably this is not Si Lapu-Lapu. This is just Lapu-Lapu, and Si is just an identifier. It was probably a title or or whatever. So that's why that's why uh, Rizal actually followed Ambrosiana, uh, uh, Amoretti's uh, suggestion to drop C in the C Lapu Lapu, and that's why we now know him as Lapu Lapu. But also that uh, the Philippine Revolution actually got inspired by Lapu Lapu because Emilio Asinto mentioned him in an essay called Gising na mga Tagalog, uh, invoking uh, the Kalipulapo, Lapulapo, the king of Mactan. Uh, where is the blood of Kalipulapo or Lapulapo? And he was telling Filipinos to wake up and fight for colonialism. Um, very, uh, what do you call this, uh, very much connected to this uh, topic is the uh, presentation of my colleague, also from the De La Salle University History Department, an associate professor in our department in the College of Liberal Arts, De La Salle University. He finished his bachelor's degree in political science, major in policy studies, and master's degree in history. He graduated with distinction at the De La Salle University in 2007. In 2008, he took up doctor of philosophy and history at the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and graduated in 2013. Uh, our speaker authored the book, Tulang Sakdal, Aral at Diwan ng Sakdalismo, published by the Commission sa Wikang Filipino in 2016. He received two national awards and recognition, the Young Historians Prize in 2014, given by the National Commission for Culture and the Arts, or NCCA, and Gawad Julian Cruz Balmaceda, awarded by the Commission sa Wikang Filipino, or KWF, in 2015. He also presented papers and lectures both in local and international conferences and published scholarly articles in respectable journals in history. To talk about the heroes of the Philippine Revolution as the guiding light for the Sakdalista struggle for genuine and absolute independence, 1930 to 1935. Here is uh, Dr. Marlon Deluc. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Xiao, for the wonderful introduction, generous introduction. Um, good afternoon to Dr. Churchill, uh, PIQC convenor, to Dr. Hernandez, the Department Chair of History, uh, to my colleague, Dr. Santiago, uh, Dr. Makapilak, and of course, Professor Xiao Chua. Uh, good afternoon also to our guests, to our teachers uh, and students of, uh, students of history. So again, my topic is, uh, yes, this is, uh, 
Okay, so the title of my paper, uh, The Heroes of the Philippine Revolution as the Guiding Light for the Sactalista Struggle for Genuine and Absolute Independence. Uh, the time period is 1932, 1935. Uh, this morning, Dr. Lars Ubaldo uh, discussed the uh, katipunan, uh, yung konsepto, kung babalikan natin yung konsepto ng liwanag at saka ng gihim. So I will try to connect yung Sakdal movement of the 1930s no, uh, to the uh, 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 revolution, to the revolution of 1896 and 1898. Um, as you can see later on, uh, there are some connections, particularly when Sakdalista venerates some Filipino heroes uh, as, their, as their inspiration, as their inspiration for their struggle uh, in 1935. Um, so, as an introduction, um, in the last decade of American occupation of the Philippines, uh, tremendous economic and political instability reshaped Filipino society. As a colony of the United States, the Depression of 1929 greatly affected the economic condition of the common people. Philippine exports like abaca, rice, sugar, coconut, and hemp lost their value in the international market. And in return, the Filipino farmer became susceptible to hunger, exploitation, and poverty. Aside from this, Filipinos became impatient of American promise of independence. Filipino politicians like Quezon, uh, Osmeña, and Rojas, instead of advocating true independence, they covertly supported American colonial interests um, in the Philippines. So my paper is divided into uh, six parts. So the first part, uh, I will try to discuss the social, political, and economic condition of the Philippines prior to 1930. Uh, the second, uh, I will give uh, the Filipino response to the social, political problems that they faced prior to 1930, uh, some protests and some of uh, uh, acts of upheaval. Then the third one, I will discuss the birth of the Sakdal movement. And in connection with the third one, I will introduce, of course, the founder of the Sakdal movement. The fifth one, uh, I will discuss about the Sakdal newspaper. This is very important because uh, the Sakdal newspaper is a reflection. You can see uh, this will provide the, the evidence of the connection of the Sakdal movement to the revolution, to the heroes of 1896 and 1898. And lastly, uh, I will discuss the Sakdal party, the creation of the Sakdal party. So I will start with the first one, the social, political, and economic condition of the, of the Philippines. Uh, the report of the Director of Agriculture to the Philippine Commission in 1915 uh, provided an overview of the, of the economic condition of, our, of the country. The report clearly indicated the sad uh, or static, stagnant economic state of the Philippines for the past decades and pinpointed the little progress made by the American colonial administrators to improve uh, the said condition. In a report by the Director of Agriculture in 1915, uh, he states that, and I quote, agriculture, the basis of all Philippine wealth, is unquestionably the department in which the American government has made the least progress. In some parts of the island, agriculture has never recovered from the destructive effects of the wars of insurrection, against Spain and the United States. In former times, the Philippines were actually exporters of rice. Nowadays, from 12 to 15 million of pesos go out of the country each year for rice, the staple article of food. We are thus to some degree dependent on other countries for our food supply. And one factor also to describe the condition prior to 1930s is the second one, one uh, World War I in Europe. So another uh, contributing factor to the sad state of economic progress was the outbreak of World War I. Uh, and since the Philippines was a colony of the United States, the prices of basic commodities like rice, corn, sugar uh, began to rise in the country. Uh, the country imported rice from Saigon, and because of World War I, Vietnam adopted a policy of control and restriction in all rice products, especially for export that greatly affected the Philippine local supply for, for rice. 
in the end, as a result of scarcity in the price of rice increase, and as a sorry, as the as a result of scarcity of of the price, uh, the price increase. And rice became an expensive commodity that an ordinary Filipino can no longer buy. But the colonial government tried to attempt this, uh, tried to solve this problem. Uh, actually, uh, the Philippine Legislature passed Act 2868 that provided a punishment for businessmen or merchants that will monopolize corn and increase the price or amount of rice in uncontrollable limits. Acts, uh, the Act 202868 20, also empowered the Governor General to create the Council of State uh, to formulate its scope and regulation and execute it in times of emergency and needs. As a result, the special powers given to the Governor General, executive orders like 53, 54, 56, 67, 71, and 83 were given in 1919 to address the, price, the crisis of price shortage in the Philippines. An example, Executive Order 56 identified four types of price in the market and fixing the selling price for each. Other executive orders simply indicated the price of other agricultural commodities like corn and possible confiscation by the government of other agricultural products if time warranted such, such actions. So aside from this one, another problem, uh, external factor that deeply affected the agricultural condition of the country, uh, and these are the internal factors, uh, such as state-imposed vaccination of cows and parabols, the issue on land taxation, establishment of banks that will give loans to farmers, and the passage of the usury, uh, usury law. Uh, in addition, land ownership was a decade-old problem. The Bureau of Lands attested that the agency encountered problems in collecting payments for public lands that were formerly uh, owned by the friars. And another factor also during this period are, are typhoons and droughts that uh, burden, burden the agricultural productivity of, of the farmers. As mentioned, another problem was the widespread practice of usury during the depression year of 1929. Most of the time, the creditors abuse the farmers who are indebted to them and what made the matters worse, banks were not capable of lending money and even demanding farmers to give foreign title to serve us as credits. In the 1920s and the 1930s, the state of the ordinary Filipino worsens. As an indication of such reality, salary became too low and getting job was very difficult. As Filipino leaders pushed for Philippine freedom, foreign investors became uninterested in the Philippines because of the lure of independence. The political condition of the Philippines and the uncertainty of its future look not so promising for capitalists to invest in the Philippines. So this added an additional, additional burden no, for, for the development of the agriculture sector. I'll proceed to the next slide. So what is the effect of this condition, of this, uh, the, the, the sad condition of the Philippines? Uh, the, the, the result is, of course, the high price of basic commodities and, of course, the loss of, the loss of jobs. So due to internal and external factors that affected agriculture and economy of the Philippines as a whole, prices of agriculture products reach unparalleled proportion. The Secretary of Agriculture in his report in 19... In 1919, indicated the abrupt increase of price of rice. So from 1914, the price of rice range was 2.50 per caravan. Uh, it increased by 2.76 by 1915, 2.68 by uh, 1917, and 2.85 by 1918. So in general, the price of rice in 1918 was 50% higher than the price of the same commodity in 1914. It was believed that the price of rice in 1918 was the highest uh, price in the past 10 years during that time. Uh, in 1924, rice production declined in the following provinces like Perla, La Union, Zambales, Navisia, Pampanga, Bulacan, Pangasinan, and Ilocos Sur. The cause of such decline was diseases that affected the farming animals, uh, insects, uh, 
Uh, and plant pests and typhoons all played an important uh, factor. For example, in the province of Laguna, uh, uh, yung uh, coconut pests uh, naka-epekto talaga ng malaki doon sa production ng, ng coconut. So why am I emphasizing these provinces? Because these provinces will serve as the backbone uh, of the Sakdal movement because majority of the members of the group will be coming from, from, from the said provinces. Uh, rice was not the only economic product that was affected by the, the depression of 1929. Paying crops that was produced by the Philippines for export was also affected and decreased their value in international markets. Abaca was once recognized as the Philippine agriculture and monopoly and a source, and a source of export, export wealth by the country stagnated because other countries in Southeast Asia were able to produce their own abaca at a cheaper price. So because of this, Filipino abaca farmers shifted to other possible agricultural products as a source of uh, livelihood. In 1928, the Secretary, the Secretary of Finance identified other economic products that lost their value in international markets. According to his report, sugar decreased by 5%, abaca by 10%, coconut oil by 5%, and tobacco by 4%. So as a Filipino response, out of this economic condition and social state, Filipino asked for reforms and expressed their, uh, their violent protests. The Secretary of Labor in 1917 indicated in his report the highest number of 17 strikes occurred in, in Manila. The primary reason uh, of this strike was the continuous increase of basic commodities and at the same time their wages remain the same. In 1920, the condition became worse and the voice of the protest, of protest even grew louder, not only in Manila but also in the provinces. In the province like Pampanga, Bulacan, Nueva and Tarlac, there were reports of agricultural unrest uh, between the farmers and hacienderos that resulted to the, to the disruption of the planting system. In 1925, the Secretary of Interior reported an uprising of about 1,500 farmers and laborers in the province of Nueva Ecija. The pricing was headed by Pedro Cabola that had the following objectives, to replace the local government of the province and to rob the elites of their belongings, wealth, and land property. In the end, the, the pricing was defeated by the Pansabalari and Cabola, and Cabola together with this man who were sent to prisons. Agriculture unrest were not only limited to the province of Nevesia, but also in other provinces. In 1926, the Secretary of Commerce and Communication intervened in an agrarian dispute between the farmers and the landlords in the province of Tarlac, Pangasinan, and Rizal. In 1927, according to the report of the Secretary of Interior, agrarian unrest between the farmers and the landlord broke out in the province of Bulacan, Laguna, Pampanga, and Rizal. In 1928, labor strike in Manila continued and spread to the province of Rizal, Sorsogon, Iloilo, and the Mountain Province. So this is the socio-economic and political condition that the Philippines have prior to the establishment of the Sakdal, Sakdal movement. So I will introduce the, the father of Sakdalism. So the people demanded jobs, lower prices of basic commodities, less, less taxation, reforms in land ownerships, eradication of the usury system, distribution of the prior lands, and changes and reforms in political leadership. So out of this prevailing social condition and unrest in 1920s and early 1930s, the voice of protest was unified and was given a distinct form by Benigno Ramos. The father of Sakdalism was born in Barrio Taliptip, Bulacan, Bulacan, on February 10, 1893. His father was Catalino Ramos, a former Katiponero and a soldier during the Philippine, the Philippine Revolution of 1896 and 1898. His mother, Binigna Pantaleon, a volunteer and a nurse that provided care and service to wounded Filipinos during also the time of the, of the revolution. So in here, we can highlight may dugong, may dugong bayani na, no? may dugong bayani na si Binigno Ramos na imamanifest niya to sa, ka, sa critical moment no, ng, kanyang, ng kanyang buhay. Binigno Ramos attended formal schooling at Malolos Primary School in the early decade of American colonization. In 1910, Ramos was able to pass an examination and receive a certification for teaching. He served as a public school teacher in his barrio for two years and decided to go to Manila in 1912 to seek his fortune. 
In Manila, Ramos became an apostle of the literary genre and wrote articles, essays, and poems that served as his means of livelihood. Aside from being a writer, he also served as an orator in public and political gatherings. He contributed articles in newspapers such as La Vanguardia, El Debate, and Ang Niti. His Tagalog poems were published in the newspaper uh, called uh, Taliba. All this writing gave Ramos the recognition of being one of the greatest literar literary writers of his time. In the succeeding years, Ramos also gives literary contribution to other newspaper such as El Ideal, Renacimiento, Filipino, Oliwayway, Sampagita, Alitaptap, and Pagkakaisa. In 1919, Senator Manuel L. Quezon appointed Benigno Ramos as a translator that paved the way for Ramos to join the colonial bureaucracy. In 1929, because of Ramos' closeness with his political part patron, he was appointed as head of the Clipping Division of the Philippine Senate. Ramos was also appointed by Quezon as the speaker and orator in political rallies in Manila and other ne nearby provinces like Bulacan. Because of Ramos' political exposure and great literary skills, he began to have also many supporters and many followers. Uh, a turning point in Benigno Ramos' career came early in the month of 1930s. Uh, sa pag-aaral nila, WADA, no? uh, sinasabi nila na ito yung racial discrimination na no? usaping pang lagi. So yung first one ay uh, involve a Filipino a Filipino uh, uh, tagapulot ng, ano, ng lechugas no? uh, in California na namatay. So nagkaroon ng protesta, they expressed their protest in, in the US and some Filipino also expressed their protest at Doneta, uh, numbering around 15,000. Another uh, usapin or issue, racial discrimination, na sinasabi, turning point dun sa career ni Benigno Ramos, is yung uh, Filipino students from Manila North High School staged uh, a, a, a walkout uh, and protested an American teacher uh, named uh, Mabel Gomit. So according to the report, American teacher used racist remarks against her Filipino students, like referring to them as a bunch of sweet potato eaters and monkeys. So because of these uh, issues uh, in the early 1930s, Ramos was caught between uh, upholding what is, well, what is for the Filipino. And of course, uh, his, uh, his position in the colonial government. And Quezon personally advised uh, Ramos not to, not to be involved not to, be, not to be involved in the issue. Ramos decided to side with the Filipino students and began to campaign against the racist American, American teacher. So Quezon uh, advised Ramos to resign his post in the government, and the latter gave his resignation on June 18, uh, 1930. So we'll proceed to the... Uh, the Sakdal, uh, the creation of the Sakdal, the newspaper. So Benigno Ramos formally established the Sakdal newspaper on June 28, 1930. That was 10 days after he resigned under the office of Manuel Quezon. In, in starting his newspaper, Ramos solicited funds from known uh, revolutionary figures, no? like Guillermo Masangkay, who contributed 50 pesos, Francisco Verona, 20 pesos, and even Artemio Ricarte uh, contributed to the newspaper, even, even for the fact that Artemio Ricarte is in, in exile. But Artemio Ricarte sent his support to the newspaper. In establishing, in establishing a radical newspaper, Ramos provided a venue wherein ordinary Filipinos can express their grievances against the established order by the Americans and the fellow Filipino politicians that supported such colonial regime. The newspaper served as a defender of Filipino rights against oppressors, both foreign and local. Uh, and we can see, perhaps we can see the significance of the newspaper on the next slide. Uh, this one is a quote published in the newspaper September 27, 1930, that provides somehow uh, what would be the stand Ano yung magiging tindig po ng newspaper? No? Ano magiging uh, uh, tindig ng newspaper against, against, of course, the issue of the time? So allow me to read the quote from September 27, 1930 issue. 
Umulang humigit ay ganito ang sabi ni Napoleon sa mga mamamahayag at pahayagan. Ang mamamahayag, ito'y nangangulugan ng manunugal, tagapuna, tagapayo, regent ng mga makapangyarihan, guro ng mga bansa. Ang matapat na pahayagang mababagsik ay higit na dapat katakutan kaysa isang daang libong bayoneta. And nagkaroon ng comparison. No? So dito ma-highlight yung significance ng sakdan newspaper na kung ipukumpara sa mga existing newspaper during the time ay hindi ganoon critical of the colonial government no so dito makikita ano yung magiging tindig ng sakdal kung gayon ganito po naman ang ating sabihin ang mamamahayag karamihan sa bayan po ay alibugha alibugha ay mapaglustay no walang pakundangan sa paggasta sa paggastos sinungaling mapagtakip ng masama tagapamansag ng kabu kabuhungan sa buong lupalo. Ang dalawang pahayagang duwag at mapaglangis sa mga taksil sa bayan ay higit na dapat pangirihan kaysa isang li isang daang libong magnanakaw. So on July 5, 1930, uh, the first issue of the Saktal newspaper was printed. Actually, I don't have the opportunity to see the first issue. What I had, uh, what, what I researched are August 30, the first issue is August 30 na. So, hindi ko na nakita itong July 5, 1930 na issue. Benigno Ramos, as a, as a proficient writer, started criticizing the American officials and Filipino politicians through his writing. So, the Sakdal uh, newspaper, let's proceed to the next slide. Uh, outline two basic objectives, political independence for the Philippines, social reforms, and justice for, for the poor. In times of colonization, stagnant economy, poor livelihood, and racial discrimination, the, the newspaper served as the sole protector of the Filipino against oppressions and fighting for asserting what is Filipino, uh, Filipino rights. So the newspaper welcomed all writers and contributors from all walks of life. Uh, Nakadaka karanihan ay mga ordinaryong mga gawa at sasakan. Uh, Sakdal means to strike or to accuse. The Sakdal newspaper basically served as the medium and means of which the citizen to be able to express their demands and sentiments against the government. On issues on independence, which is the more pressing issue of, of the time, and mismanagement by the ruling elite, because for how many decades the Filipino elite are asking for independence, and yet by 1930s, uh, parang hindi pa rin nakukuha, no? ba, hindi pa rin nakukuha yung kalayaan. At by 1933-34, makukuha man ng kalayaan, pero yun nga, may mga agenda behind no? sa pagkuha ng kalayaan. In an initial printed issues of 6,000 copies in 1930, the number grew to 18,494 in April 1931. The increase uh, in printed issues simply signified the support of many readers coming from the Tagalog provinces and major, and major cities in the Visayas and Mindanao. The mass support was a clear indication that the people personally believed in the genuine roles, uh, sorry, goals and objectives of the newspaper. Uh, it is also worthy to note the importance of using Tagalog as the medium of the Sakdal newspaper to further extend its reach to the ordinary Filipinos. This also bolstered the belief that by using Tagalog, they are showing a strong example for Filipinos to love their very own language, develop their very own culture, and uphold their own national, national identity. Now, I will proceed to what are the clear evidence or sign that uh, the Filipino heroes of the revolution of 1896 and 1898 have their influence on the Sakdal group. So the first and very obvious uh, um, sign, of course, is, I'm not sure if you can see the picture on the slide, but uh, on the upper left of the title Sakdal, you can see an image of, of Rizal. So, uh, influence uh, of our heroes of Sakdal can be found on the front page of the newspaper. Uh, this is exactly more than a year after the first publication. So this was in August 1, 1931. So more than a year after the first publication of the newspaper, a distinct change can be seen in the front page of the Sakdal newspaper. So inad na nila, after one year of publication, inad na nila yung image of Dr. Rizal. No? Uh, that can be seen on the left side, again on the left side of the newspaper. And the tagline, of course, of the newspaper is very, well, very nationalistic in a sense. Uh, Sakdal, Malaya, walang Panginoon kung hindi ang 
pwede ang bayan. And a few months after, and a few months after, and a few months after, in an issue of Sakdal dated September 5, 1931, aside from the existing Rizal image, the newspaper also used the image of a great Filipino propagandist, Marcelo H. Del Pilar, that can be seen uh, on the left side. So Rizal is on the right side of the Sakdal uh, title and Del Pilar on the left side. And they will use this one, this format, the image, up to the last issue of the newspaper that is available, up to the issue of the newspaper on May 30, 1936. So such reality show Filipino long tradition of colonial resistance using the newspaper as the medium in fighting oppressors, both Spaniards, and of course, in the case of the Sakdalista, the Americans. So this tradition is very long from the La Solidaridad, the Kalayaan, the KKK newspaper, and of course, the Sakdal newspaper. Sakdalistas venerated Rizal and Dettler and serve as their inspiration in their very own, uh, in their very own writings. Uh, as evidence of, su of such veneration in the latter part of December 1931, the Sakdal newspaper remembered the anniversary of the death and execution of Dr. Rizal. Sakdalista offered the following words in honoring Rizal's nationalism and sacrifices for, for the country. And, and I quote, Ipagluksa natin ang araw ng pagkabaril sa dakilang bayani ng ating lahi, Dr. Rizal. Sukat na mga reyna at kasaysayan. Gunitain natin ang mga naghirap dahil sa ating kasarinan at panumpaan natin ang kalayaang iyan, ay sisikapin nating uh, matamo. In glorifying the Philippine Revolution of 1896 and 1898, uh, illustrations were also used to capture such, uh, such sentiments. In a Sakdal issue dated September 26, 1931, the newspaper used an image of the Inang Bayan. Uh, I'm sorry about the picture, I mentioned about the picture, pero picture siya sa lower, lower bottom left side ng Inang Bayan, uh, praying for divine guidance for her to be set free. Sakdalista uh, writer echo such calling in the following words, and you can see it in the, in the screen. Hinihingi namin unahin natin ang pagtatabo ng kasalinlan. Pagkat dito lamang matatagpuan ang ganap na kaligayahan ng ating bayan. Hinihingi namin ang pagpapakasakit ng lahat upang matamo ito. Samantalang wala tayong pagsasarili, ang lahat ng kapihan ay tatamuhin natin. Walang sawang mabatipusin namin ang lahat ng nakakasagabal sa kasarinlan. At sa pagsasagawa namin ito, ay lilimutin namin, ay lilimutin namin ang kaibigan at mga utang na loob upang ganap na may tanghal ang katotohanan at ang katwiran. Uh, they also use cartoons to send messages across to renew the struggle for independence and to remind Filipino leaders and the general public not to compromise with the real objective of giving uh, pure, absolute independence for the Philippines. In a Sakdal issue dated October 3, 1931, Rizal, Del Pilar, and Bonifacio. So Del Pilar is in the middle, Rizal in the left, and Bonifacio on the right. Uh, they remind Filipino leaders to prioritize uh, Philippine independence, uh, Philippine independence above, above all. So aside from the common, the, uh, the, the, the usual uh, or clear sign, like the, the cartoons and the, the image. Of course, we can see also the influence of revolution of 1896 and 1898 and Filipino heroes to the Sakdal, particularly if you will assess the newspaper, uh, particularly the poems in the newspaper. So, Sakdal Radical Poems. So, Sakdal newspaper also contains poems written by Sakdalista members and ordinary contributor to their cause. With more than 160 poems, the recurring idea presented are venerating heroes to fought for Philippine independence. So, ito yung pagsasariwa, no? pagbabalik dun sa ginhawa, no? dun sa liwanag. Such as Rizal, Del Pilar, Bonifacio, Gada Gomborza, Baltazar, Aguinaldo, Ricarte, Luna, Sakai. So these are the heroes that they venerate. Uh, Paulit-ulit, no? paulit-ulit silang makikita doon sa mga tulak. No? Uh, and of course, yung mga terms like bayani, uh, laya, kaapihan, bandila, uh, katipunan, 
a magsipan, uh, one de la Cruz, were terms and idea that were constantly present also in their in their poem, in those 100, uh, 160, more than 160 uh, poems. So I'll give some example for you to have an idea. Uh, I just classified the poems into three parts. The first one is Kalayaan at Kasarindan. The second is Education at Wikang Pambansa. Then Kabataan, uh, uh, ang hope, no? ang hope ng motherland. So they give strong emphasis on, on having or acquiring Philippine independence, absolute Philippine independence. Because for the Sakdalista, uh, this is the solution to the social, economic, and political problems that, that we have. So in, an, in, a, in a poem written by Pablo Evangelista, published by the newspaper in August 1, 1936, the title of which is Salaga ng Kalayaan. Uh, uh, I'll just read some part of the, of the poem. Ang sagot ay ito, uh, Sinaburgos, Gomez, Zamora, at Rizal. Bonifacio Luna at maraming luba na anak ng bayan. Nang dahil sa, ila, nang dahil sa laya, wala sa panahon na puti ang buhay. Kaya pag ang laya, ang pag-uusapan, ay walang kapantay ang kahalagahan. So giving emphasis to the, to the continuity of the struggle for Philippine independence that can be traced during the time of Rizal, during the time of the Katipunan. Uh, it's a continuity that the Sakdalista embraced by the 1930s. Then another one, another example for the first one, Kalayaan ng Kasarindan, is a poem written by Vicente Sison from Neva Isia, uh, the title of which is Matamis Ang Kalayaan. The poem was, uh, was printed in the newspaper September 21, 1936. Uh, I, I just leave, uh, read one line. Si Sabantayog ni Gatrizal, Salonetang Napagbantog, ay malayang pinalipad ang watawat na natubos at ang awit ng damdamin samantalang tinutugtog, nagpugay ang mga taong may luha ng pagkalugod. Pagkaraay, nagsigawan, nag naglundagat, nagpakutok. Binupikal ang kampana, ang silbato'y pinatunog. So these two are just some of the example for the first one. Now, the second one, uh, edukasyon at wikang pambansa. Uh, this is uh, largely connected to the first, first one because for the Sakdalista, kakambal, kakambal ng kanilang uh, layunin for independence. Because of course, pag malaya na tayo, uh, we uphold our own national identity. So, pagpapayaman, pagpapayabong sa ating pambansang identidad, sa, pambansang, uh, sa ating pambansang kultura. At paano ito may isasagawa? Diba? So, ang unang hatlang para may isasagawa ito ay, of course, yung pagmamahal, pag-develop sa ating, uh, sa ating wika, no? sa wikang sa wikang Tagalog. So, yung etong emphasis ng pagmamahal sa wika was uh, reflected also in the in the poems, no? So, I'll give a, uh, an example written by Enrique Agleham, uh, published by the Sakdal newspaper uh, July 9, 1932. Uh, speaking of uh, Osias, no? Dito is nilang isang Pilipino, ulay kayo mangi dugong Ilocano. Aywan ko ba kung bakit si Apo Camilo ay na naginip maging Amerikano. Nung siya'y bata pa, kay sarap ng kain, nang binangong ang pinakbit, diningding. Ngunit nang matikman ang putserong hain, pati ang lamesa, ibig ng baguhin. Malilimutan ng dakilang burgos, ang bayaning Rizal, ating malilimot, ang ipagtatayo ng mga bantayo ay mga bayani ng bagong at igo. And another one that also emphasized on this national identity to promote the national identity of the Filipinos and of course to love our culture, our language is also a poem written by Pres Delgado Calabia from, uh, from Pasig. The title is Quintas ng Katotohanan. So it was published in the newspaper um, September 5, 1936. And, and I read, uh, Kung sa dami ng bayani ay marami tayo ngayon at marami sa kanila ang salaya ay umaayon. Pawa silang magigiting kung sa wika magpupulong, ngunit kapag sa gawa na ay, lahat sila ay umuurong. Nung unang bayani ay sa gawa na mamalas, nang di tulad ng sa ngayon sa bunganga magigilas. Nung unang bayani sa anuman walang gulat, sa ngalan ng inang bayan kamatay ay niyayakap. Nung una tayo dito may gat, bizal at balagtas, na tulang in iniwanay ibanghelyo na pakalat. Kung ganoon ng ganoon, mga tulang na masusulat, ang mata ng aking bayan ay kay daling mamumulan. 
Now for the last one, Kabataan ng Pag-asa ng Bayan, na uh, since that time, many revolutionaries, no, mga veterans of the revolution are still alive. Uh, and some of them are members of this uh, Saptal, Saptal movement. Uh, one in particular is this Arcadio Rivera that uh, wrote a poem. Arcadio Rivera is from Makinabang, Baliwag, Bulacan, and wrote a poem, Magpatuloy Kayo. Uh, in the poem, uh, Rivera is very happy, very happy for the Saptal movement because they are continuing the struggle for, for Philippine independence. Uh, and I will read the quote. So, sulong kayong lahat, mga batang sapdal. Kaming matanda na lugmok ay tulungan. Kayo ang pangarap ng bayaning Rizal na siyang gagamot sa sugat ng bayan. Sa paglakad niyo sakaling malinsil at sa maing palad, buhay ay makitil. Uh, ay asahan niyo ang paggalang ang kin sa dibdib ng bayan doon malilibing. So, I'll proceed to the last part. So, this is the last part. This is the Sakdal party, and the Sakdal party have their own uh, and have their own logo. So the picture that you can see on the slide is the logo of the Sakdal party. So three years after the birth of the Sakdal newspaper, uh, Benigno Ramos decided to establish the Sakdal party on the seven, on October. Sorry, on October 29, 1933. Uh, 23, 26, Juan Luna, uh, Gagalangin, Sundo, Manila. The Sakdal General Assembly was composed of, of a national council, provincial, provincial council, municipal council. So each council, uh, the national, provincial, and municipal council is composed of the president, the vice president, the advisor, secretary, and, and the treasurer. And the Sakdal party have the following uh, objective. So political empowerment and independence for the Philippines. Development of the Filipino culture and identity through education and the development of a national language. Separation of church and state on issues of politics and morality. And lastly, attaining social, social justice. So if we focus now on the logo, the Saktal party have this logo. Uh, they have the word Sakdalista. Uh, can be seen on top of the shining star. The shining star represent the, well, represent uh, Bathala, represent Bathala and the guiding and the guiding light and represent the, the heroes of the revolution. So at the bottom of the star was a heart above an open right hand. At the bottom of the right hand the initials L X B A S F can be seen. Uh, an open right hand symbolizes the continuity of the of the Sakdalista to struggle for Philippine independence. That was initiated by the Katipuneros during the revolution of 1896. The heart symbolizes the conditional love and devotion of the Sakdalista for, for the Inang Bayan, for the mother country. The stars uh, symbolizes Batala and the ray symbolizes the guidance given by great Filipino heroes that the Sakdalista will use against the colonizers in attaining independence for the country. The initials LBASF were defined as follows. Uh, lupain, lupain ng bayang api uh, sa Kapuluang Pilipinas. And the Sakdal Party in reality became, became the, the real, no, sa kasaysayan natin sa politika, the Sakdal Party became the real opposition no, during the time of Quezon and Osmeña. No? Talagang kinatakutan no? yung, yung partido na nagbigay na ito para talaga mawala yung hidwaan ni Quezon sa kanilang Osmeña. No? Dahil nagtakot sila dito sa party na ito na nag-proof talaga uh, because of their supporters as the true opposition. Uh, by 1938, the name of the Sakdal Party was changed into Ganap Party and new officers were elected and appointed to key positions uh, uh, key positions in the, in the party. I'll proceed to the conclusion. So in conclusion, any social movement like the Sakdal was a product of its time. Formed by its social, economic, and political milieu, it once challenged not only American supremacy in the Philippines, but also how Filipinos will view their brand of nationalism and political independence. So ano ba yung kanilang brand of nationalism and political independence? Absolute, complete independence. No, so yun yung kanilang brand of independence. So walang mga string attached. So kaya nga, they resist yung passing ng hair was cutting, hair was cutting and tidings of the uh, In presenting the rural and agriculture life of the people, the hardship of the common tao, or the masa, 
the social inequality of the times and oppression, not only not only from the Americans, but also from fellow Filipinos. Sakdal provided a cure, uh, serving as inspiration, the life of Filipino heroes to address the social disease that plagued the Philippine society from the start of colonization. The movement uh, paved the way of awakening a consciousness that is very much needed in the most critical period of American occupation of the Philippines through freedom and independence uh, viewed from the lenses of the common people. Uh, and to formally end my presentation, I would just like this to show this one. Uh, so ito po ay, ay awitin, no? it's a song that they uh, that uh, that na naging sentro ng kanilang protesta dun sa Tidings of Duffy ng 1934. So, iniba lang nila yung lyrics, iniba lang nila yung lyrics, tapos uh, uh, nilagyan lang nila, no? uh, ibinasi nila no? yung, yung kanta sa ating, ano, sa ating uh, national, national anthem. So, bayang magiting na ayaw maalitin, bituwing maningning ng aming pagliliw. Kami ngayong kawal ay handang makilaban sa ganit na bakay ng mga dayuhan. Sa bayan mo't kabukiran, sa ilog mo't kaparangan, ama nami nangamatay dahil sa iyong kalayaan. Lahat ng Pilipino nakadigma dahil sa iyo, kaming anak mo narito, pabawiin ang laya mo. Pilipinas namin pinakamamahal, di ka namin pababayaan, manulupig ay dapat na mamatay. Mamatay, mabuhay ang aming mal. Mabuhay. So maraming salamat sa pakikinig. Thank you po. That ends my presentation. Mabuhay. Buhay, Dr. Delupio. Buhay ang uh, diwang makabayan. So, there you go. Uh, ito po, nakita nyo, uh, the, the connection of our, ano, yung parang, uh, shall we say, uh, genealogy of the spirit of freedom from Lapu-Lapu, 1521, to Serizal, the the Katipuneros, and of course, eventually, the Sakdal, or the Sakdalistas of the 1930s. So, uh, you, you will, uh, it, it, in many ways, it encapsulates the victorious attitude. What victorious, another one of our colleagues says, the literature of victory, ang literatura ng tagumpay. Uh, that uh, was also, uh, shall we say, uh, used by Andres Munipasio and Emilio Stinto, a certain kind of literature that proclaims victory uh, despite the odds. So there you go. Uh, we would now open the floor for uh, questions, uh, but before that, I would like to again uh, welcome everyone to uh, panel B of session four, Religion, Colon Colonialism and the Revolution, Quiz and Teller Reflections, convened by the De La Salle University of Manila, De La Salle uh, University of Manila History Department and the National Historical Commission of the Philippines uh, in partnership with the Department of Foreign Affairs and uh, in solidarity with the uh, quincentennial commemorations in the Philippines, the 2021 year of pre-colonial uh, ancestors and funded by the Philippine Spanish Friendship Day. So... Sige, let's look at the some of our questions. Uh, one comment here from uh, Randy Noblesa. Salamat, Dr. Delupio, sa pagbabahagi ng mga dokumento maging ng mga tulang sakdalista. Ano po kaya ang maaaring matutuhan ng mga kilusang panlipo ng nais magpagawon ng deskolonisasyon ng pamamahala ng ating kapuluhan? Sir, uh, Rand, uh, Sir uh, Delupio. Yes, yes. So makikita natin sa mga tula, no? Actually sobrang dami nila, no? More than 160. Pero ang common na uh, theme, no? Na uh, lumalabas doon ay yung pagmamahal, 'di ba? Pagmamahal sa inang bayan. Although in reality, pag tinignan natin kasi, 'di ba, nag-extend pa tayo sa kasaysayan ng sakdalista, hindi magiging maganda ang kanilang contribution, no? Kailangan yeah. usapan ang panahon ng digmaan. Uh, pero dito kasi, no, sa part na to, no, sa kinover ko tong period, makikita dito yung ano, yung genuine uh, true, pwede natin sabihin true, wagas tunay na no, pagmamahal sa bayan. Na kung pabalikan natin ang ating kasaysayan, di ba, yung konsepto natin ng neocolonialismo, 
ng postwar. No? Yes. Ayan yung ayan yung ano eh, ayan yung warning, 'di ba? Ayan na yung nakikita, ayan na yung foresight ng mga sakdalista kaya ayaw nila ng mga tidings smackdown pitong hair rose cutting, 'di ba? Kasi mayroong mga strings attached. So ang gusto nila during that time ay absolute complete independence. So yon. So makikita natin dito yung tunay, yung tunay na pagmamahal, no, malasakit sa sa inang bayan. So siguro yung pinakamagandang aral na may babahagi po nung samahan. Oo, maraming salamat Dr. De Lupio no? kasi isa ka doon sa mga tao na nag uh, uh, naglabas nung diwang makabayan na dahil lang doon sa doon sa ginawa nila, of course, so nung ilan sa kanila, ako ayaw akong sabihin na yung buong samahan yun eh, nung mga pinuno, no, nung mga ilang sumama, pero marami doon sa mga naunang miyembro, no, ay at yung una nilang mga ginawa, at unang sinulat, di sa really, you know, Uh, two patriotic feelings that we can also get from them, no? The, the spirit of their uh, in of, in their works, no? Uh, yung pagmamahal sa bayan. So tama. Salamat uh, for reminding us. And we, let us put everything in context. Kaya nga in Kinoverni, Dr. Delupio is the 1930s. You you can get from the uh, Commission so Wikal Filipino yung kanyang aklat na tulang sakdal. Ano? Nataniyan pangilinan says here, even if the sakdalistas had their darker side. They were collaborators with the Japanese. Their patriotism should be recognized. Uh, I can remember yung lagi kino quote ni Dr. Derry na um, um, tulani binigno Ramos, no, yung milyonaryo kamanan hari. Kung ang bayan mo'y alipin, alipin ka pa rin. Ayan. So, yun po. Uh, I would like to now uh, ask a question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, wherein uh, some, I, I think it can be related to the Malay world. So I would like to ask, and, and of course, because Dr. Fernando Santiago is also uh, uh, one of the one of uh, an, an enthusiast also in the, of the history of weaponry in the Philippines. I would like to ask this question: Do we have our very own martial arts that are widely practiced before the Spaniards came around, Sir Fernando? Sa totoo lang po, hindi, yan, hindi ko pa pinag-aaralan yung bagay na yan. <clears throat> Pero alam natin na very capable warriors yung mga Pilipino nung duman, dumating yung mga Kastila. Madalas ang mga kwento ang nadidinig natin base sa social memory, hindi ho ito base sa mga dokumento, kundi sa yung bang naipasa lang na information or assumptions about the past ng mga tao. Eh, mas advanced yung weaponry or better quality yung weaponry ng mga Kastila. Pero hindi ko totoo yun kasi yung mismo Magellan Expedition ay nabilib sa kalidad ng mga weaponry ng mga Pilipino including yung mga wooden spears na tumatagos dun sa kanilang metal armors na hindi sila nakakita ng ganong klaseng mga gawa sa kahoy pero tumatagos dun sa bakal na suit nilang armor. Ngayon, uh, pagdating po sa paggawa ng mga, uh, uh, let's say, swords, okay, kagaya ng mga kampilan at saka mga kris, kung titingnan nyo yung metallurgy na involved, Uh, very advanced. Okay, pero malinaw na dumaan ito through Indonesia at na influensya hindi ng China. Kaya hindi masasabi ng primitive yung yung uh, yung level ng quality ng mga weapons ng mga Pilipino at the time. Pero to address the question yung um, meron bang martial arts? May mga ilang accounts na sinasabing may mga magagaling makipaglaban. Okay, na may, may isa pa nga, hindi ko malala kung sino na lumilipad daw sa hangin pag nakikipaglaban. Eh. So in my imagination, martial arts yung ginagawa nila. Ang modern na uh, description dun sa kanilang style of fighting, eh, kali, di ba? pero yun yata mga American, yeah. Filipino-Americans pang gumawa ng term na yun. Uh, pero kung ano yung historiography, historicity, di ba? yung ano man yung, uh, yung, yung talagang tunay na pinagmulan niya, hindi natin mas sabi. Ngayon sa Island Southeast Asia, meron ding iba-ibang klaseng martial arts, okay, kagaya ng silat, uh, yung silat na Malaysia, tapos yung ginagawa sa Indonesia na malamang hindi nalalayo doon yung ating martial arts noong araw. Pero yan naman po, uh, eh, meron ding mga tradisyon na nagtutuloy uh, hanggang sa kasalukuyan. So kailangan lang siguro may magde-deconstruct, mag-unpack nitong mga modern martial arts kung posible para makita kung alin ang galing sa labas at alin talaga yung dito sa atin na develop. Okay, pero so hindi ko talaga nasagot yung tanong pero ang gusto ko lang sabihin eh uh, hindi man natin alam kung ano yung kanilang martial arts. Ang alam natin, very capable warriors sila. Right. Okay, so meron silang alam. Hindi lang natin alam kung ano yun. Yun right. lang po. 
kasi assumption lang eh yung yes. as, yung ano yung sinasabi na di yung kali daw may iba nag term daw na kali sabi ni Jeffrey ano pero yung termino nga yung angis yung lahat ng yan yung assumption yun eh that this was how our ancestors did their sword fighting na ginawa lamang it's an assumption walang direct link although it's very possible na uh, hindi naman natin yan dinidiscount and thank you also Dr. Fer, uh, Dr. Santiago for connecting it also to our greater Austronesian and uh, Dunya Melayo na may mga similarities din sa weaponry ang ating uh, mga ninuno. Salamat po. No? I would like to, by the way, uh, I would like to acknowledge po the presence earlier of uh, former chair of the History Department, uh, Dr. Maria Florina Ovello Suan, and, uh, and her students in the his, his in class. No? Uh, there are 12 people from the his in class uh, na, na kasama na, na no, no, tinutuhuan niyan. These are our AB History students. I actually also invited to come with us, my students in the public history uh, class of mine, and I also invited uh, some of our students in the GE ratings in Philippine history. So sa mga studyante ko po dyan, shout out po. At sa lahat po, to all those faculty from our department who actually said, uh, who actually invited their class. Thank you, thank you for uh, doing so. Uh, I also would like to recognize one of the conveners of the PIQCC, Dr. Nela, who is also here with us ano, in the Zoom. Marami po salamat for uh, coming. And also, uh, our uh, uh, part of our secretariat dito, the conveners, si uh, Janta Tina Saba. Thank you so much sa inyong uh, uh, support at tulong po sa akin. Again, I would like to emphasize before we continue with the discussion, that we are uh, on uh, in, uh, shall we say, oh, there you go. We are actually in a hundred, almost 100 Facebook pages, primarily at the National Queen Centennial Committee, Department of Foreign Affairs and other foreign service posts, National Historical Commission of the Philippines, National Commission for Culture and the Arts, and for this session, the DLSU Department of History Facebook page. This, the Philippine International Queen Centennial Conference is the biggest so far international conference of historians and uh, history teachers and and uh, actually a lot of people who are uh, in, interested in Philippine history and the uh, commemorations of the 500 years of victory and humanity. No? This is the biggest. I think uh, more than 30 panels, imagining you and this was only uh, possible because of the current situation of the pandemic, and we are on online mode, and napakaganda talaga na magkasama-sama tayo kahit ganito po ang ating kalagayan. Mabuhay! Ayan. So I would like to now ask a question. Uh, ito, this is very interesting, no? From Juan Gabriel Almasan of the De La Salle uh, University College of Liberal Arts to Dr. De Lupio. How did religion directly influence the Sakdali, the Sakdalistas in their desire for Philippine independence? Was it from the inculturation of Christianity as means of salvation of the Filipino people from colonial oppression? Or was it more than religious influence? I think also uh, connected here is a comment from Edgardo Granada about the Pasyon Mahal as uh, something that is uh, a text for the struggle to freedom. Uh, Dr. Delupio? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, kung babalikan yung tradisyon ng mga sakdalista, makikita talaga din dito yung tradisyon ng mga katipunero, no? yung liwanag at saka ng bilim. Diba? So, laging ganun, na they are conscious na yung panahon nila, the 1930s, the 1920s, na ito ay panahon ng kadiliman. No? Uh, dahil sa, of course, yung in-explain ko kanina, dahil dun sa economic condition that they have. No? Uh, hirap ng buhay, uh, walang uh, walang kasaganahan. So, ganun nila ito nakikita, yung muling pagbabalik doon sa, sa liwanag. Yung muling pagbabalik sa liwanag. Kaya nga, paulit-ulit nilang sinasariwa eh. No? Yung mga bayani ng revolution, revolution ng 1896, revolution ng 1898. So, paulit-ulit yan. Recurring yung ano eh, recurring yung pagme-mention dito sa mga Filipino heroes na to. Sa lahat ng mga writings nila, no? sa mga sinulat nila doon sa newspaper, 
although meron din silang mga critical na mga bayani na sinisira in a sense, no? Pero ayoko nang i-mention yung mga yun. Pero uh, ang kadalasan na ipinagpakita dito is yung naging sacrifices ng mga Filipino heroes during the time of the revolution. So ganun makikita yung pagtingin uh, doon sa notion, no? Pagpapatuloy po ng notion ng ng liwanag na liwanag at saka ng dilim. Siya wala kang audio siya. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you Dr. Delupio. Salamat po, no. Ah, uh, actually Dr. Delupio nakakatuwa, no. Marami po ang naging interesado sa inyong uh, um a presentation. I just read some of the comments. No, no, no ni at yung ko said uh, malinaw ang paglalahad ng sakdalismo, masaya at magiliw ako nakinig. Buo pa sa salamat na kami ay inapo ni Don Celerino. Uh, si Tiongko, Seferino si Tiongko, one of four local heroes of the Santa Rosa Laguna 1998, pagnugot ng pahayag ng sakdal ng si Bidig Ramos ay nanatili sa Japan. Ayan, salamat uh, uh, Ma'am Donia Tiongko. Uh, meron pa dito, no? sinabi niya na si Israel de Ocampo, no? na maaari bang may sama sa curriculum ng panitigan sa high school ang mga akdam na isulat ng mga sakdalista, Anong dulog ang maaaring ilapat sa pagtuturo nito? I think hindi ito masasagot ni Dr. De Lupio kasi ito'y tungkol sa pagsasama sa curriculum. Ang payo na lang natin siguro for the interest of time is pwede nyo actually isama yan. Uh, again, ang curriculum may isa lamang gabay. Meron tayong free will gamitin natin ito. Ano ang magulala lang? Hindi, look like... Pagbasa. 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 Oh. Yes, pwede. Pwede po. Pwede po yan. Pwede, pwede yan. Salamat po. No? Aha, so may mga comments tayo from Facebook naman, gusto kong basahin. Madami mga estudyante actually ng Lasal na magagandang komento and I cannot read them all because there are so many, ano? Ah, uh, mukhang mukhang ano to, no? Ah, uh, ito yung kanilang attendance, way of attendance no? sa kanilang mga professor. Pero thank you kasi they did some very good comments. Very good comments po, no? Ah, uh, basta tayo ng isa. Nasaan ba yung kay Ayan, si Hajar Harbi, sabi niya, though we can see how rich our culture is, let's not deny the fact of what happened during Spanish colonialism. Uh, colonization had its motive to utilize inexpensive labor and natural resources. So, yes, uh, Hajar is uh, saying na, uh, ano yan, kumbaga, uh, this is not a celebration. We must always remind ourselves that this will never be a celebration of colonialism. But it's a recognition of the effects. No? When we talk about the Catholicism, for example, in the Philippines, we're not just talking about, you know, the the uh, uh, yung yung natayo yung ginawang Catholic lang. But we we appropriated based on our perspective the Catholic faith, and of course, as Dr. Reynaldo Ileto, one of our visiting professors, said that we appropriated this faith, this uh, text of the Passion. Uh, in our struggles for uh, freedom. So yun, marami pong salamat. Ano? Um, wow, thank you. So many comments. Uh, thank you so much for all, to all our students from uh, uh, De La Salle uh, University. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, one, one from Kyle Herrera said, I've always wondered what made us so similar to our neighboring Southeast Asian countries, the similar beliefs, languages, and cultures that we all share. It is interesting that we are tracking back our Malevos even though we have been heavily influenced by Hispanization or Spanish colonialism. And many, many other comments. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Santiago, I would like to ask this question from a teacher. He's a faculty, I think. Yes, he's a faculty from... I, I, learned, I, I knew him from UPIS. I don't know where he is now. Pero si Gringo Corpus, sabi niya, Magandang hapon po. Ano po ba ang mas akmang gamitin sa pagtuturo ng kasaysayan ng Pilipinas? Lahing Australisyano, lahing Nusantao, o lahing Malayo? Marami pong salamat. So I think this is a question of semantics. Actually, sa totoo lang po, para sa akin, pare-pareho lang yan. Kaya nga, exactly. Frankly speaking, I mean, just to be, I'm sorry, okay, but uh, just to be, you know, plain, uh, it doesn't really matter because we understand what it refers to. And that's what matters to us. Pero Hi. siguro, uh, nakakontextualize lang, kasi nga, yung, yung reading sa binigay ninyo, ginagamit yung salitang Austronesia, no? then ipaliwanag ninyo doon sa mga estudyante nyo kung bakit merong uh, ibang terminologies na ginagamit. Pero yun yan, as far as I'm concerned, uh, they all refer to the same people. Apo, oh, yun lang po. Dr. Ferny, maganda siguro, we can talk about this ano, for the interest of our viewers and our, you know, 
delegates on the Philippine International Quincentennial uh, Conference, there is actually, and, and actually na-touch nyo ito eh, yung the, the um, shall we say, the, anong tawag doon? Hindi naman irritation, but yung hindi sila comfortable, the, hindi comfortable some of the Mal Malaysians, no? or ma some of the Malays, the Filipinos are actually identified as Malays. Yes. Uh, and uh, ano po yung ginagawa nating steps to actually bridge this misunderstanding? Okay, so medyo loaded po yung tanong na yan. Oh, okay, Multifaceted na po. question. Kasi merong iba-ibang uh, meaning ang salitang Malay. So pwede ngang uh, anthropological term ito di ba, para dito sa mga tao na isa dun sa four major races ng araw na Caucasian, Mongoloid, Malayan, at saka Black. Okay, yun ay makikita nyo na uh, ginamit ni Rizal na classification ng different races. Caucasian, Mongoloid, Malayan, and Black. Um, pero nung panahon na yun kasi nga, uh, dahil kina Carl Linnaeus, diba, kinaklasify ang mga tao na parang mga hayop na as if iba iba tayong mga species. Um, to a great extent, okay, uh, marami ho dun sa mga racist na points of view, eh, rooted din sa, dyan, sa, dyan nagmumula yun eh, diba, sa pagtingin na hindi ka uri o kapantay uh, sa pagkatao ang iba dahil dito sa mga classification. Yun nga lang, uh, over time, di meron ganyan, pero sa kaso ng, ng term na Malay, ang Malaysia nung nag-declare ng independence, it define kung anong ibig sabihin ng isang Malay. At kahit sa kanilang constitution, makikita nyo na ang Malay, or hindi man constitution sa isang patas nila, makikita nyo na para maging Malay, kailangan maging Muslim. So, naging integral element ang Islam ng Malayness. So, dahil dito, merong mga uh, kapitbahay natin sa Malaysia, pati sa Indonesia, na dahil dun sa technical term na yun, ang kinikilala lang na Malay sa Pilipinas ay ang mga kapatid nating Muslim sa Mindanao. So, pag pinag-usapan ngayon yung Malay sa Pilipinas, marami sa kanila sasabihin, yung mga nasa Mindanao, yes, pero yung nasa Luzon at sa Visayas, hindi. Pag tinanong nyo, eh kung hindi sila Malay, ano sila? Well, kung hindi Polynesian, mas mga tipong parang mga Mexican. So, kaya makikita nyo na hindi, ano eh, hindi necessarily aligned yung mga iba't ibang definitions at ginagamit na meanings ng malinis. Kaya nagkakaroon itong misunderstanding. So, nakukuha nyo ba yung sinasabi ko? Pero yun niya lang, uh, pag sinabi naman na well, at least among the circle of uh, scholars, okay, so hindi ho ito yung usapan ng uh, kumbaga ground level diba, na usapan sa kalye. Uh, pero sa isipan ng mga maraming binasa tungkol sa issue lahat, pag pinag-usapan yung malayness as a race, okay, mas, uh, marami naman kinikilala yung mga Pilipino as part of the race. Yun niya lang, ang tanong dyan, mahalaga pa ba na tinitingnan natin ng isa't isa okay, na iba-ibang lahi? na kung tutusin na mahalaga, eh, pare-pareho tayong mga tao at pantay-pantay sa pagkatao kung meron mang pagkakaiba. Right. So, And someone said here from Ibrahim Fawad Kalaf, uh, there is an FB post of uh, one certain Filipino scholar that says Filipino is not a race. There's no such thing as Filipino race because uh, there's no such thing as Filipino blood or pure Filipino. It's just an umbrella of several ethno-linguistic groups, etc. And I think even the Malay race in itself, para kasing, uh, not, we are now using it as a loose term, not as a race, race per se, as in, you know, DNA-wise, but really as leaping Filipino in the sense of, in a cultural way. Yes. Yun, na yung, yun na yung nakikita natin. So when we talk about the uh, pride of the Malay race, uh, or, or something like that, we're not really looking at it in a DNA way or you can but but you know that's that's one that can be one part of it or even in the filipino -ness. but also yung yung belongingness in a culture diba and uh, yun nga yung sinisikap natin with search despite of our diversity that we see our commonalities and that would uh, give us a, 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 a reason in many ways to have contact with each other because in any way we're in one boat in this what we call the ASEAN uh, community in the Yehuba. So, yeah. maraming salamat. Um, thank you. Thank you po. Um, okay. 
I'll, I'll read some more questions and comments lang na uh, kaunti na lang siguro ito. No? Ah, sorry if we cannot read all your questions and all your comments. I really thank you for your participation. This actually our, our, our audience are very participative. Uh, I just want to look at our st stats. And by the way, before that, I would like to say for those of you that, yeah, uh, please check your emails for those who are in the Zoom. For your attendance today, please check your emails for the panel evaluation form that will be sent within the tw next 24 hours. So um, I think the Secretariat can help me here how to, you know, get the, shall we say, the certificates. No? I, I think you, you should uh, get the panel evaluation form for those who are attending from our Zoom. Okay, so uh, also I would like to check the our viewers. No? from from mm -hmm, from our facebook page uh, national i'm sorry okay here it is there okay we have 166 active viewers now so thank you so much for that and also we have 110 comments 30 shares and 85 uh, likes and I think we will have more viewers in other uh, other shall we say pages. Okay, mm -hmm. let's uh, check. Okay, thank you to everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ciao. Ciao. Yes. Apa? Yes, Bob. Yes, Please. Address, address ko lang yung isang tanong. May nakita akong tanong kanina. Meron daw bang babae na sakdalista? Ay, May... apo. Mon Mona Lisa Ibanez. Oh. Salamat po. <laughs> nakita ko. Uh, pero before that, uh, good afternoon lang kay Ma'am Chong po uh, from Santa Rosa. Good afternoon po, Ma'am. Sige po. Uh, ang kanyang uh, grandfather ay uh, isa sa mga top officials ng sakdalista movement. No? Nung tama yung sinasabi ni Ma'am, na Excel si Binigno Ramos ang nag-takeover to manage the group ay yung kanyang grandfather. Wow. So, so to address to address yung sakdalista na babae. Well, meron may mga babaeng sakdalista. No sa katunayan nga mayroong isang balangay, may branch ng sakdalista sa Cavite na yung mga members ay kababaihan. So meron silang set of president, vice president. So may isang balangay sa Cavite, specifically sa Cavite, ang nagtatag ang nagtatag no na puro kababaihan. Tapos doon sa mga contribution, may minention ako kanina na isang kula na babae. Actually, isa lang siya sa napaka maraming babaeng contributors ng kula. Eh. Marami pa sila na nag-contribute. So hindi ito puro kalalakihan. Uh, malaki rin po yung gampanin, yung role na ginampanan ng mga kababaihan no, sa ating kasaysayan, lalo na po na sa pagtataguyod ng ating uh, kalayaan no, sa panahon ng mga Amerikano. So yun, so meron po, meron po mga kababaihan sa pagdalista. Ayun, salamat po. At siyempre, hindi ako nagkakamali, ano, sakdalista din itong nanguna dito sa Abuya, o, hindi ako nagkakamali. Ah, yes. Salud, yes. Ah, salud al Gabre. Salud al Gabre. Oo, yes. salud al Gabre, generala. No, na siya yung nagsabi na talagang quotable quote na nagsabi na uh, walang himagsika na nabibigo ang lahat ay isang hakbang tungo sa tamang direksyon. Yun. Uh, we're now down to our uh, few. I'm sorry, you know, there are so many questions, but I, I will now down. I, we will now go down to our last few ones. I would like to uh, question. I would like to read a comment from one of our conveners for Dr. Fernando Santiago. While the Philippines was Hispanized, they did the illustrados reclaim our Malayness through their historiography. Thank you for the two lectures. Okay, so ganito po yan. Um, to begin with, kaya nila kinilala na sila yung Malay eh dahil sa uh, Western Social Science. Uh, kagaya ng sinabi ko nga po na hindi nila, hindi nila ginagamit yung salitang Malay to describe themselves. Di ba? Kami Tagalog, kayo baka Bisaya, baka sila Ilocano, Kapampangan. Pero no, habang nasa Europa, na-expose itong mga uh, scholars natin na kasama ng mga ilustrado dito sa taxonomy na ginagamit. Okay? At nung makita nila yung mali as a unit to define our group of people, at dyan po, medyo malaki role ni Ferdinand Blumentritt sa pag-enlighten kay Rizal. At si Rizal naman, 
uh, ganun din na nag, nag, nagbabahagi ng kanyang pananaw dun sa issue. Pero sa kanakita ni Narizal na sandali, o oh, nga, mali nga tayo. So in other words, kaya parang Western, uh, well, Western, ang, yung knowledge ng malayness is a Western knowledge product. Hindi ito construct na sa atin ang galing na inadapt ng mga ilustrado. So, ang ibig sabihin ko dito, hindi necessarily nare-reclaim yung malayness, kundi na-discover nila yung kanilang nakaraan na kung saan bahagi sila nitong mundo. Okay, na tinatawag natin ngayon na mali world. So, yeah. mas, mas sa kultura, okay, uh, pero yun niya, produkto sila ng kanilang panahon, kaya nakikita rin nila yung sarili nila na kabahagi noong lahi. So sana po nasagot ko yung tanong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. tama. Um, okay. Mhm. Okay, titingin pa at kanina mayroong comment si Ibrahim Fawad Kalaf no na sana daw eh uh, napag-usapan din yung uh, um, yung contribution ng mga Muslim. Uh, I think may mga ibang panels po na nag-recognize at uh, nagtalakay mo nito at kung hindi man eh ito ay Uh, uh, natalakay ng marami sa ating mga Queen Centennial activities. In fact, dito sa Queen Centennial Commemorations in the Philippines, kasama ko ang Sultanates of Sulu and Maguindanao. Dahil nagkaroon po tayo ng paglalagay ng mga markers ng dinaanan ng uh, Magellan Elcano Expedition, no, papunta sa Tidor, no, na dumaan sa maraming uh, lugar na islamiko, no, at kung ano yung pinakita ng ating mga ninunong moro no sa mga bisita natin liban pa ho doon sa uh, kasama ng mga moro sa struggle for 500 years of kumbaga valor and victory at sabi nga natin naging victorious pati ang mga uh, muslim sa ating uh, uh, bansa no dahil uh, sila ay nakapagtayo ng sarili nilang pamahalaan so siguro po Since uh, I think uh, medyo ano mahaba na ho yung ating open forum no I, I just check kung meron pang ayos ni mga komento pa rin ayan no Ah sorry po uh, Mr. Bulletin ano kasi wala ho yung mga nasa FB po eh hindi ho makakatanggap ng certificates only those who have registered in our Zoom po no uh, marami pong salamat Ah uh, yan sige si Rosalyn Esconde sabi niya thank you uh, I also would like to Um, greet my mother Vilma Briones Chua and my father no si Charles Chua who had uh, uh, his uh, 60th birthday last November 9 siguro po uh, sir Fernie uh, and uh, to close our uh, discussion no uh, sir Fernie and sir Marlon uh, anything you want to add or anything you want to say uh, to our delegates po uh, in this uh, the Philippine International Quincentennial Conference So, mauna na po ako since ako nakabukas ng camera. So, nakakatuwa lang po una, nakakatuwa na ganitong kalaki ang, ang interest at uh, napaka, well, very impressive ang reception dito sa series of uh, lectures. Hindi lang itong atin, kundi yung buong series of lectures. At malinaw na buhay na buhay ang kasaysayan sa Pilipinas. Um, ang akin lang po naman, eh, habang inaalala natin ang, ang halaga ng Uh, pagdating ni Magellan no 1521 sa Pilipinas at tandaan din po natin na nag 125th anniversary rin ng Philippine Revolution of 1896 at kaya nga po medyo parang nalihis ng konti yung yung panels natin ngayong araw pero kagaya ng pinakita namin meron din namang connection okay right. konektado rin po ito pero mas ito yung produkto after uh, yung long term okay nung nag-umpisa nitong pagdating ng 1521 So yun na po, maraming pong salamat sa lahat at uh, binigay ko yung aking email address kanina kung sakali meron pa kayong gustong tanungin. Uh, feel free to get in touch and I'll be glad to answer your questions. Yun lang po. Good day. Ayan, maraming pong salamat, uh, Dr. Fernie. In the Zoom, we actually have 236 participants. So imagine mo, no, hindi na magkakasya yan sa ating mga venue sa Lasal. <laughs> no, kung sa Lasal na tayo nag-conference. Uh, so thank you, thank you. Ay, wow, talaga naman. This is really public history. In action, and I think I have to say this: that the Department of History of the La Salle University would like to strengthen our public history and heritage component, no, sa ating mga courses. So we would like to call Dr. Marlon Delupio, no, one of our social historians, 
No? Ah, Hi, John. Yes, Address ko lang yung isang tanong. May tanong kasi kanina. Meron ba sa kanina? May sakdalista daw ba sa Visaya? Actually, meron din. No? Meron mm-hmm. sa Cebu, uh, Leyte, Bohol. So, meron dyan. Tapos, meron din sa Mindanao, Davao. So, may mga sentro kasi. Meron ako isang nasa Rixit na meron silang ano, na, nag-distribute sila doon ng mga, ano, ng mga newspaper. So, makikita kahit na initially, wow. Tagalog province ang core, di ba? ang core members dito. Kasi nga, kasi nga Tagalog yung wika na ginagamit. Kumalat no, yung samahan from Luzon, Visayas, and, and Mindanao. So, siguro bilang panghuli, uh, ako po yung nagpapasalamat sa lahat sa pagdalo po sa araw na ito. Na yun nga, given po yung limitation that we have, di ba? Parang mas naging productive pa kasi mas marami tayo ngayon kumpara dati pag face-to-face, di ba? Mas... mas kokonti. So ngayon mas marami ang nare-reach po ng ano ng dialogue, 'di ba, ng pakikipagtalastasan sa kasaysayan. So muli maraming salamat sa pagdalo at uh, ingat po tayo lagi, no? Yeah. Thank you. Um, maraming salamat uh, Dr. Delubio and uh, Dr. Santiago po, no? And so I would like to end our session today by quoting Emilio Asinto in his essay Gising na mga Tagalog. Sabi po niya, saan na patungo ang dahas at tapang ng inyong mga magulang niyong sila'y nakipaglaban sa mga tagaibang lupang yaan nang di pagharihan ng sino mang puso itong bayang Tagalog? Saan na patungo ang dugo ni Kalipulako, ang masiglang hari sa Maktan, niyong pinatay niya ang lilong si Magallanes? No? Di yata mga kapatid, di yata kayo lagi nang nakagapos dyan sa gustang haligi ng lubahang nakapupuot nakapusungan. Di yatat sa inyong buhay, wala nang makikita kung di hirap dalita, sakit, lumbay, dusa, kam, tamisa. Hayo na. Hayo na bayan ko ikaw ay gumising. Ikaw ay magbangon. Buksan ang mata mo ikaw ay magbasin. Ay, bayan kung sawi. O mga kaibigan, ha? yan po ang makikita ko natin. The events of 1521 animated our struggle for freedom. It also gave us a more colorful culture, religiosity, and history. Uh, and these complications of history made us who we are today. Yan na po ang tapestry ng ating pagka-Pilipino. Kaya marami pong salamat po mula po sa De La Salle History Department Gayun din sa ngalan ng National Historical Commission of the Philippines, Department of Foreign Affairs, sa pakikiisa po natin sa Quincentennial Commemorations in the Philippines, sa Year of Ancestors 2021. Marami po salamat. Ako po si Xiao Chu, isang public historian, ang uh, nagsasabi po sa inyo, no? makasaysayang quincentenario sa ating lahat, mabuhay ang Pilipinas.